Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Adam Steele, and back again is Mr. Liam Wright. How are you? Hello, you I'm are hello. Here. Good. I'm hello. I you are hello. hello. You are quite the hello. hello, yes. I am all of the hello. No, I'm, I'm doing all right. Uh, 2020, but coming out the end of 2020, looking forward to seeing 2021. I've got one day left of doing any work before I can sit on the sofa mm. and uh, play some cyberpunk. Good stuff. A little bit less than me. I've got a bit more to do, but not that much more. I'm having a bit of a break as well. But yes, that's our general theme of the podcast this evening is uh, end of 2020. We'll do a bit of a rundown of what, what's been positive and good uh, about the industry, about us stuff. Got a few few news topics to go through, but understandably it's quite light on news as we approach Christmas and the new year. <clears throat> it's actually that close to Christmas now. I don't flinch at saying the C word. <laughs> Which for the first half of December and any part of the year before that, it doesn't exist. Oh, but yeah. this year it existed as soon as it was as soon as it was November. We needed something <laughs> to look forward to. Only in your house. That's, a lot uh, of people's houses around the world this year. Yes. I think, I think I don't, I, I'm, I'm with you most years, but I think this year, as soon as people want to put the Christmas tree up, you do you this year. You deserve it. Yeah, fair enough. We're um, at home all the time as well, so it's nice to make the house look fun and interesting and different. We stare yeah. at the same four walls for nine months, 10, 11 months. Yeah, it's quite fair. I've been, uh, staring at the same eight walls of, of the home studio and then the studio studio mm -hmm. but then also 12 walls because if you count john brown's studio riff hard uh headquarters uh mm -hmm. me and him have been basically holed up together for the past mm -hmm. several months in our own little social bubble and mm -hmm. yeah we've got a lot done but yeah i looked at the calendar a couple of days ago and it was oh december the first and now it's december 17th i know right mm. The days are just going quicker and quicker and quicker, especially with uh, the child and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, she can put three words together now. It's torturous. <laughs> what are the three words? Are they specifically like no, anything? Or? Just just any any three words. She can kind of make word combinations. Okay. Like a uh, mother, Mickey was at, was at work, and I was looking after her yesterday, and she's running around the house going, "Mummy, mummy," and I went, "Mummy's not here." She's like, "Mummy, not here." Uh, and uh, processing that combination of words and going, ah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so it's terrifying. But yes, coming up, uh, we have replacement knobs for your pedals that you can't mess around. New Nuendo that's got stuff. Uh, a box that can make online jamming a reality. And some expensive stuff from Heritage Audio. This is the Hop Pole Position. There we go. The intro has been signaled. The beacons have been lit, and I will be blowing my nose and sneezing a lot, which I apologise for in advance. But my uh, my allergies went crazy today, so I'm fine. I'm okay. It's just this is the aftermath. It's lots and lots of achoo. Hopefully tempered by my <laughs> lovely old fashioned. A few weeks ago, I got myself some ice trays, ice cube trays, where the ice cubes are one and a half inches cubed they are huge nice. and it makes the I difference because yeah i have a sing cheap. i have a single ice cube in that oh you have wine i have wine i have some cheap morrison's wine mm. it, is, it is okay sometimes it's, it's just okay. what you need I'm, I'm fine like cheap white wine like dry white wine i'd have fine absolutely fine I, I always go for like if anything under four quid i'll buy it yeah like, that's fair. It's I've al I've always found, and some people will turn their noses up, but I've always found that with white wine particularly, there's very little difference yeah. between something really expensive and something that's passable. And again, I also think the same with red in terms of, like, you can get a really bad vinegary red wine, but yeah. most of the time, it's fine. But then once you go past sort of, like, 10 quid, then you can taste the difference. I don't really feel you can often taste the difference between a £4 bottle of wine and a £9 bottle of wine. In oh, most interesting. Instances. 
I def I definitely do notice, but then that's kind of one of my things is red wine. But I'm I'm not a cork sniffer. If something's cheap, like it's gonna be cheap. Bottle? Are you getting like a fifteen quid bottle that's on sale for eight quid? Like No, because that's worth eight quid, it's not worth fifteen. Wow. Uh I don't tend to fall for sales very often. Um mm -hmm. unless it's something I wanted anyway and it's half the price of what I was gonna pay, in which case, yes, please. <laughs> but yeah, no, um, if there's 10 different things on a shelf and one's on sale, I don't take the, the discount price as, oh, a bargain. I look at it and go, okay, that's what it costs now. <laughs> so is mm -hmm. it any better than the others? <laughs> Although but, I did, I, I think I managed to win um, Black Friday this year. Ooh. I said, I, I said on the last <laughs> podcast, whatever I've been on, I can't remember with time. You mentioned it. But, yeah, I've got two two fourteen forty P curved Samsung monitors. Ooh. Two of them for four hundred quid. Is that where all the lighting yeah. on you is coming from? Are the screens just bathing no, you in a glow? From, someone was saying that in chat. Um I should be able to. No. Boop. This one. There we go. So that's that's my shell. Cool. Oh. Um there you go. Oh actually got up now. Nice. That. That's my that's my dinner. <laughs> Yeah, you just got a camera on your shelf at all times. <laughs> yeah, that's that's for when I'm at work now. If I'm away, rather than have to step, so I don't have to step my own face all the time. Yeah, like if I'm on calls with like other people, it's like I'm. They can just look at my Dota characters. <laughs> it's a good technique. I like it. Oh, you need to you need to see me again, though, don't you? There you go. Um, oh no, we could see you. Yeah, you had gone back to the the right angle. Oh, good. Hmm. Grain alcohol and vanilla cherry Dr. Pepper. Oh, yes. I don't think you can find vanilla cherry Dr. Pepper in the UK, but that was one of my favourite things when we went to Nam last year, which I'm going to miss this year, was that you could get yeah. cherry vanilla Dr. Pepper. I'm going to miss the jerky. The jerky we got on the way back on the, <laughs> the airport. I think I ate pretty much all of it before we got back to the UK. Oh, yeah, amazing. you just snuffled. Turkey jerky. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, so some of the food it'll kill you in LA, especially, but it's so good. Mm. Well, there is, but twenty twenty two. Yes, damn twenty twenty two. We will be there. I'm sure of it. Yeah, twenty twenty one. We won't be there, and neither will anybody else. But things are happening. Um, I signed a document today, which means I can't talk specifics about a thing. I hate that, but. There is something that I will be dropping on Nam Day. Uh, as here's a new thing. Check out the new thing. And I'm hoping to maybe secure one or two more of those, but it's quite unlikely now because a lot of offices will probably be shutting at the end of this week for Christmas. Yeah. Uh, because of the timing. And then there's not enough time really after New Year to spin the engines up and get things over to me in time for filming and such. Mm -hmm. But yes, Danny says put the camera on the dog when you're on a call. Yeah, but dogs are yeah, unpredictable. Never... Yeah, well, it's like it's when I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are unpredictable, and also there's there's still a lot of mess around part of my office at the moment. Got it all nice and tidy, and then Black Friday came, and we bought a load of stuff, and now it's all it's all a mess. I haven't tidied up yet. Well, That's exactly what later. happens. You you tidy up perfectly, and then something happens, and then. Uh... Before you know Box. it, oh no, yeah, boxes and stuff. There is so much cardboard in this building at the moment. Oh, yeah. You've seen it. Oh yeah, I've got a ton of boxes downstairs, um, in front of the uh, the studio doors for another thing which well, I can't gonna, talk about yet. I'm try and, yeah, I'm going to try and take everything that I can from the main office upstairs. So I think a lot of that's some of your old stuff as well. I'm going to try and take all of that tomorrow, hopefully. So um, there'll be room up there to move some boxes back into that main room. Oh, that's oh, that's, that's gone. yeah, that's fine. I mean, the boxes that I have downstairs, I have for a studio reason, uh, which will come out in the I new thought, year. I thought you didn't announce that on Facebook. I'm sure I saw a photo. No, that was the Celestian thing. The Celestian oh, right. thing I am very public about. That is happening because that's not under an NDA. That is entirely my project. So I can talk about that. Um, oh, I think you know the other boxes. Yeah, the big boxes. <laughs> The big boxes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yes, this this is what we have to do on stream. You see now, because it's like a puzzle <laughs> game. It's kind of fun, but oh boy, on the box, mate. 
Yes. Uh, but yeah, the, the Celestian video is coming along. I have every speaker now, as you may have seen last week. Uh, I now have my performances in the bag and in my Dropbox from Ross Campbell, the Bulletproof guitarist, and from Jack Gardner, who's the Neo Soul dude, who's incredibly good. And so I'm now waiting on videos from John Brown, who I'm seeing this weekend, so I will give him a poke and be like, Oi, camera, play. So that'll be three. Um, who else have I got? Um, I've got Henning Pauly has agreed to do the bluesy stuff. Jamie Humphreys is doing his stuff over Christmas. And I've also now got Glenn Fricker doing the extremely heavy parts. So that's now six guitarists confirmed. So yes. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. I'm setting myself up for a lot, lot of work. So, but it's going to be good. It's going to be one of those big videos that when it goes out, it'll be one of those videos that people keep coming back to. So it'll be worth it. Oh, yeah. yeah, they will. They did with the last lot of videos and nobody's really come up with a response to them since. So yeah, it'll be, uh, yeah. You know that thing we did? Here's one that's 10 times better. Watch <laughs> this. Hmm. <laughs> Hey. it'll be uh it'll be good it'll be worth it but yeah that and amongst everything else that i have to do i'm i've got a lot of stuff in the edit queue right now for riffhard.com um which is john brown's web website um that was one of the the best things for me to happen on the second half of this year because um yeah let's 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 recap some of the cool stuff that happened this year shall we before we get to the news hot pole rewind hot pole wiki wiki rewind um, so the first thing that happened uh, this year was Nam, like we talked about. It was, it, it was our first Nam, and mm -hmm. yeah, probably not the first last time you knew. Been away together in six months. Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, first time we've been away just on like for a work-related reason in a good couple of years, though. Yeah, quite a while for us to, because we used to fly all around Europe. Yeah. Probably Ireland was the last one. I think it might have been, yeah. But yeah, we've um, we've flown to Ireland and parts of Europe and done some pretty big jobs, but Nam was uh, a whirlwind to end all whirlwinds. Yeah, it was the furthest we've been and it was it was a it was a lot of fun. It was a, yeah. lot, a really good experience, like both culturally and like work point of view. I was actually talking to someone earlier about Anaheim. Right. Um, it was just fascinating. Yeah, it's. I just didn't uh, expect California, any part of California, to to be like that. Um, it was very interesting, very cool to like be in a Disneyland as well. And I you know, always think of like Disneyland as being the very like touristy type places. Yet so much of Anaheim is just a place where people live. Yeah, well that's that's the thing. LA as an area is so big. Yeah. It's massive that that there's suburbs and then there's the suburbs you know and a lot of it was almost quite i would say almost urban for america where we were there was a lot of kind of what do you call it mexican heritage i suppose is what you would describe a lot of the uh, the families around where we were staying because of course mm -hmm. it's not too far from the mexican border so that's uh it's a big part of the culture around there yeah and yeah it was fascinating so what, so what is your favorite thing about nam if you just like just thinking back now just close your eyes what what experience, what can you pitch in your mind about being in that um, big, uh, what was the building called? Oh, the uh, the Los Angeles Convention Center. I thought I had a better name than that, but yeah, that place. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to struggle to think of my favorite experience in that building, but my favorite experience of the week there was when we went to a, an after party for Celestian where they had cowboy hats and line dancing. Mm-hmm. And an open that bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that really was fun good. And the food as well, <laughs> like mini slider burgers and things. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I think it's... it was just, for me. It was just walking around that. I can't remember what the building was called, but the one where um, Slate were, um, and there was just so many kind of super influential people there just milling around mm. that I've seen you kind of fawn over for years, mm. just working and just 
I just I don't know. I thought that was the, one of those surreal rooms. Oh, the the me. hall. The... A lot of tech in there. There was a lot of performance and like really talented people that that they were running their own business at the forefront in that room. Was that the 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 separate building where the ground floor was yeah, all the all downstairs. the speaker makers yeah. and people like mm -hmm. that? That yeah, I I knew quite a few people from those stands, which was bizarre to see them all in one place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, some of the most interesting moments from that. Oh, a really good moment from... Didn't Townsend doing a mix as well at one point in that room? When yeah, we that's, there. he was in the main hall, I think. But oh, yeah, Devin, Devin sure Townsend was at the... Room, yeah. It was at the wave stand, wherever that was. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. might have been in there. But yeah, Devin Townsend yeah, was, was breaking down the mix of the room. song Genesis. And I just kind of mm -hmm. walked past and stood and stared for a while. Just like... Mm-hmm. Mm. Who but needs yeah. his dad teaches line dancing at a senior center? That's awesome. Nice. <laughs> line dancing. There was a lot of line dancing at that um, Celestian party, actually, wasn't there? There was. It was like the only <laughs> line dancing place for miles around. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it turns out that a lot of people take that seriously. Which mm. I suppose, again, it's a cultural thing in England. You just don't get it. It makes no sense. Well, line... you have like a Morris dancing. Yeah, which also makes no sense, let's be fair. But well, people that do it take it really seriously. Yes, they do. Or at least they take it seriously for about 30 minutes and then they find the nearest pub. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Difference between line dancing and Morris dancing, in my experience, because I've known people who Morris dance, is that generally you do the Morris dance festival, then you go and get really drunk. The difference is, when you're line dancing, you keep drinking and you keep line dancing. <laughs> yeah. And keep being really good at it. <laughs> So after so after Nam, what was your second highlight of the year then? Second highlight of the oh. year? What was what? The Reaper Course, the yes. Warren? The release of the Reaper Course, which is tied to Nam because we met Warren Hewitt for the first time at Nam. Because we've been talking to him before he that. He may well have had COVID. He may well have had something. He was on another planet. He was, yeah, poor guy was ill he as was you like. And then, and then I was very ill after meeting him as well yeah but, yeah um, you were was, you were in bed for weeks yeah but we don't know like that, that's not saying he had it he was just ill i mean it just feels like because that was the start just before all this happened yeah but he was really really ill but the trooper that he was like yeah, he carried he did on do before all this it sounds bizarre doesn't it now the mm. idea of being really ill and out still working but that was the culture of what everyone did yes just 12 months ago and he was out there doing his thing and he still came to see us and he was trying his hardest to articulate his words but he was struggling bless him yeah but yeah I, I i do remember all the stress of me spending four to six weeks before nam editing all the reaper course so that i could show it to him and be like look i did it it's a thing and he was just like yeah man yeah, yeah because the poor guy was just yeah he, he was, was yeah very <laughs> ill <laughs> Yeah, it was impressive that he was still going. But yeah, that that was a big highlight. Releasing the Reaper course when we did, it had a massive, massive impact. That I, mm -hmm. I just, for us, it was just, let's make a thing and see how well it does. And I put everything I had into making sure it was good quality. And after it was released, Warren called me, video called me and said, right, here's how it did in the first month. And I nearly fell over. I was just like, mm -hmm. wow. And really popular. Did yeah. Really, really well. It it went down incredibly well. Which reminds me, I must ask him how it did over Black Friday. But yeah, that was a big deal. Um, another big deal was the Victory Cabs job, which mm -hmm. sent me absolutely insane while I was doing it. But I had to be absolutely meticulous. And yeah, getting together all of the cabinet captures for Two Notes and for Victory was huge i had to go and hire some expensive microphones i say expensive i mean like th between them if they all got broken you'd have to sell your house to buy replacements so there's me driving around with like uh, the u47 a real neumann u47 them i don't know if you can buy one you might be looking at 30 grand mm. yeah that's a lot and i was driving around with that plus more going ha ah! ha and so yeah made all that happen that took weeks of insanity but yeah the the reaction that i've had from that has been fantastic 
like anyone I've talked to in the industry who does anything to do with virtual cabs if i say yeah i did the victory stuff they're like that was amazing you just like wow stand out of the year for for a lot of people which is fantastic that's nice yeah it's 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 just yeah people seem to just just know about it which is great Mm -hmm. and yeah that's been a big a big plus for me uh, so yeah, th- those are the big things this year. But those those are just the biggest events. It's been a lot of good stuff um, this year for me. But it's been interesting as well having to, having to diversify the studio, not being able to have people in. Yes, um, and having to find new ways, and that's why the course was such a big deal. And not just because it's allowed you to do full time um, on the YouTube, but because you had to do full time YouTube because we yeah. can't have people in the studio. Yes. Like all our ideas of getting more people into the studio in 2020 and things that we sat down in terms of business plans of <clears throat> sorry what we can do just not feasible like we had to just given that the studio is in a cellar with as we mm. said before with the only ventilation being mechanical into both rooms yeah like there's no safe way to to do it and also we live above the space so it's putting us at risk if people are coming in and out and we take the dogs mm. out through the same door and stuff. So yeah. like we've had to find a way to diversify. And luckily, like this year, like things came together all at the right time. So that whilst a lot of people have struggled this year with work, um, we've been really lucky. Yeah, really we, lucky. we really have been. I mean, oh, you we, say look, it's, it's hard it's paid work off, paying off. Yeah. But it's paid off. The, the, yeah, it couldn't have paid off at a more opportune time. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Which is, we didn't plan there to be a pandemic when we were releasing all of this, but we no. were planning for it to come out this year. We we did wonder actually as the the repercourse was being released. You know, oh no, everybody's uh, stuck at home. Is this going to sell at all? It turns mm-hmm. out the other way round because a lot of people were stuck at home. They were looking for something to do, mm-hmm. and so <laughs> it just kind of worked out for us that people were looking and go, oh, Reaper's affordable. I'll try that. I don't know how to use this. Let's have a look for, you know, and so they find me, they find the course, they, uh, they get the course. Mm-hmm. And yeah, hopefully it's helped out a lot of people. And so that's, that's been a big, big thing for us. Definitely. Yeah. The, the podcast has gone from strength to strength as well. We've had quite a few major guests this year, which yeah. is good. We've had people, from mostly youtube but coll- collectively the the people who've been on the studio on, on the podcast i worked out have between them over two million subscribers so yeah we've had a fair few names on there mm-hmm. yeah of course i've had john one brown from weeks, monuments what, what, one week without me even knowing yeah you guys would have known there was one week where i came with the discord and tried to call adam and he didn't pick up and i was like why is adam not picking up then i go to youtube and he's live with someone else it's like he's cheating on me yeah. he forgot to mention that he had a guest for this week and i was just sat there i <laughs> cried yeah i wondered but, if you might bring I that up was. i think but... it was henning and i was like i am not even offended like this <laughs> is cool that's that i'm watching said i think it might have been henning it might have been earlier than that but yeah, whoever it was had been so excited that I got him on that I set it all up and forgot to mention. It's like, oh yeah, by the way, I got this guest. It's just like, ah, yeah. oops. It's funny. No, it's fine. It's funny. Yeah, it's um, yeah. it's a strange well, thing when uh, it's a bad thing that you got a great guest, but yeah, it all worked out in the end. <laughs> but yeah, because of of this year, I mean, uh, also at Nam was the first time I met Glenn Bricker in person we talked a couple Mm -hmm. of times before that but now we've become good friends he's doing the celestian video for me i've been on his on his channel several times now oh you missed a huge highlight of the year what what was that think about it what have you missed he's gone blank I, I, i have gone blank when did when else did you leave the country Oh, 42 Gear Street. Yes. yes. Yeah. That was a that was a massive highlight, absolutely. Um mm-hmm. but yeah, everything that's come from that has been massive as well. Of course, mentioning Henning, how can we forget 42 Gear Street was a huge event. Cause yeah, nobody else was going out at all for anything. And I was quite nervous to uh to leave the country. 
but we did everything that we had to do proper quarantining and isolation and everything and i got to meet some of the most fantastic people so i'm now friends with henning as well and uh andy ferris he's brilliant and there's uh carl golden jack gardner who's involved in the celestian thing and ross ross campbell mm. i feel like i've met a lot of the important people now in our YouTube space in person and personal contact is so important, even though we all kind of tend to work from our own little boxes anyway. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, apparently people in chat saying you're an adult superstar. Oh, that's yeah, Scott, Scott from Chernobyl yeah. Studios being weird again. Hi, Scott. No, someone the other week said that I had an OnlyFans account, and I don't know whether it's just become a random meme or whether I'm, af I'm afraid someone's, like, hacked into my uh, yeah. webcam and, like... It's not a very expensive got... OnlyFans account. Everything's very affundable. Fundable, yeah. I mean, I've got an Alexa in my bedroom, so... And the camera's covered up, so hopefully... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not an adult star. You've got a what in your bedroom now? Got an Alexa. With, oh uh, the right, thing on the, right, right, right. The camera thing is coming up. So, ah, I don't think I, I've got an Echo Dot. I think that's all I've got. No cameras there, luckily. No, we've but, got we've got a few. But all our lights are now um, Wi-Fi lights and stuff. So very fancy. My lights have um, on and off switches. <laughs> yeah, mine don't, and that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, mine. If have Amazon to... servers go down, I can't change my lights. <laughs> That's worrying. Did you see that Google servers went down uh, this yeah, week? Yeah, well, I was working. Yeah, and couldn't. I, had, I took an early lunch. There's nothing mm -hmm. I could do. It wasn't for long, was it? It was like ten minutes. But it was uh, enough. It was. En it was enough to be. I'm having an early lunch. Yeah. <laughs> and an extended lunch at that. <laughs> hey, sometimes that's just what you need. Yeah. It's almost Christmas. It's fine. Yes. I've had lots and lots of fancy new gear has arrived this year. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, my Rev Generator Mark III will arrive before the end of the year. Very excited for that. Because uh, that's the single biggest purchase I think the studio has ever made. Because uh, uh, the Rev Generator Mark III amp. Um, so I, I don't know if I told you this, I bought an amp. <laughs> You said you were thinking about it. Yeah, so they offered me a deal, and so I couldn't refuse at that point. Uh, but it's still right. still expensive because at full retail, they're about three and a half thousand dollars. Right. But this thing does everything, every modern sound you can think of. Uh, so very much a flagship thing. I think the biggest expense, single expense for the studio before that was the Allen and Heath mixing desk which mm -hmm. at some point and i've been considering this and i think i'm pretty sure now at some point that is going mm -hmm. that's no longer going to be in the studio um as it happens i know a studio engineer in bradford who has a lovely double wooden rack where all rack gear units can go that would perfectly mm -hmm. fit in there and he's building himself a triple rack to go in its place so i just said to him uh can I have that one? <laughs> so I'm giving them a little bit of money, but yeah, there's um, it makes more sense for a modern studio, I think, to have more outboard gear in place of where that desk was. So mm. next really? year, that's going to be... Go the, whole, the whole reason of having it was for the perception of the studio. Yeah. Um, a lot of the studio was digital other than the, sort of the analog preamps and stuff. Yeah. But we've got so much gear down there now it's not like it doesn't look like a, a working studio and then no. secondly it doesn't need to be because that's true we're not having people in what year not been any what year did we buy the desk was it 2013 um 2014 it will be it will be 2014 yeah yeah because a lot's changed as well in five or six years i think a lot of people now just accept that studios don't need a mixing desk Whereas mm -hmm. only five or six years ago, that was very much the accepted thing. Is you went into a studio. I think it, I think it depends. Like <clears throat> it depends whether it matters as well. Like if you if you see a photo of a studio, like you have a look like stock image of a recording studio or anything, there is no there's not a single photo that won't be in front of a mixing desk of some form. Most of them sort of digital interfaces of some form. Um maybe but on the same level, 
like that's only that's going to appeal to like the types of clientele that we don't we're not appealing to yes so yeah well that's that that's the thing an experience the studio so to speak isn't our thing so no a lot of those type of studios are not there anymore that's the thing i mean but then on the other side of things there are a lot of studios now for what we do especially rock and metal where the desk is gone but in place of it is a big bank of guitar amps that mm -hmm. you can go i want to play with yeah. that one and that one and that one and that one and the guitarists are just geeking out over it mm -hmm. and also there's something that i'm going to be investing in next year i think which is an ampeat switcher so that i can have eight or even 16 guitar amps plugged in all the time okay and then you just turn the ones on that you want and then you've got a remote control and you go okay i want that one now click which is very cool yeah so yes <laughs> that's the kind of thing i, I think that this side of my room to have the Alan and heath up here and just just have this one mic plugged into it <laughs> just for style well if you want to you know where it'll be but yeah i might have to I drive just, I, love, I, I love the look of mixing desk yeah i just think they look so cool i completely agree with you like the, the rationale of what you're talking about makes complete sense i yeah. just really love the look of them i do and if 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 the studio was twice as large as it is which it's not small by any stretch of the imagination, but when you start, you just, you just don't need it. Like no, but it, it's that. When that was the last time you really used it? Must have been twenty seventeen, I think. Yeah. Last time I used it, but especially with what I do, with what we do, with getting nice new gear in all the time, a lot mm -hmm. of what we wanted the desk for was things like lots of preamps, and I I have much better preamps that get sent to me, so it's mm -hmm. like. Not only do I have this nicer gear, but I also feel like I have a sense of duty to use the gear I've been sent. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's good stuff, so I'm not complaining. And because of that, even if I'm recording a full band, I look over at the desk and I've not powered it on, and I'm like, oh, oh, right, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another yeah. session where it doesn't get used. Yep. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Scott's saying, yeah, that's what Christian Cola does, amp switching. Yeah, it's very common now. Uh, John Brown's got an amp switcher and it's just him in his room. Um, Frederick uh, from Meshuggah has what he calls the amp library. I think it's 64 amps all connected. That's, yeah. that's just silly, but the fact that you can do it is just beautiful. And so it's you still have to go and... So what? How do you power them on? You still have to go and flick them on. Yeah, you've got to turn them on, yeah. but you don't have to like unplug the back of them and plug speaker cables in and reroute the front and everything. You just that's all wired in permanently to a switching box, so that when you want to change from one amp to another, you you literally and cabinets as well. You can have up to eight cabinets connected to this thing, so you can go cabinet O three select amp zero seven select, and it'll just go click click. Mm -hmm. and when you've yeah it it's as much clutter saver as it is time saver because once you've plugged all your cables in you can you know nicely trunk them and cable tie them and hide them and and you're not spreading cables everywhere because if you've ever seen me in the middle of a full busy studio session it looks like i've taken three boxes of cables tipped them on the floor kicked them around screamed a little and then sat down <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I would like for that not to be the case but as it stands that's the traditional way of doing things you get the things out you plug them in the cables are on the floor <laughs> and it just uh yeah mm. oh yes and uh, a big crap big board with a crap ton of 500 series units says Puninja. that that's another thing that i want to do next year is get some uh containers for 500 series units and then get people to start sending me them because they're very cool and i would like to be a 500 series nerd but right now i don't have none <laughs> so mm. but yes um videos like this big celestian video should help with the profile somewhat because i'm really hoping that between the 4k cameras that we have now and the extensive production quality that i'm going to put into this 
we should, fingers crossed, get the video of the year there. But we'll see. Because cool. we, we don't know what other people are doing at the same time, do we? But hey, even better if there's two of them for people to argue over this one's better, that one's better, and then have to watch mm-hmm. each one ten times to compare them. <laughs> so, should we look at the news 35 minutes in? Let's do it. It's time for the news. These made me smile. These are called Peace Potties. Uh, so, lock in your favourite pedal settings. I don't know if you've ever had like, a pedal like, I've got this on my desk of plumes, and somebody like a toddler has come in and changed the settings or kicked it and moved them, and it was perfect. It's really mm-hmm. annoying. So these, what you do is you take the uh, the cover off your pot and you pop this thing on that's got a metal ring on the outside that doesn't move. But the inside, you can move. You've got to get a screwdriver or a pick or something to move it. Uh, right. But it can't be accidentally moved. Which means okay. that once you've found a perfect setting, you're good. I like the okay. idea of these, but they're not cheap. That's the problem, is that even with a special discount, uh, they are €24 Euros or $28.50 a pair. Ooh. That's kind of expensive. But then mm. the question remains, how much is your setting not being messed around with worth to you and i can see this being one of those products where a lot of people are going to go how much that's stupid and then a few people are going to go excuse me i'd like them please money no object i want this (laughs) Mm -hmm. because yeah you know this year's not been the right kind of year for uh touring guitarists but yeah this this i've got a little bass pedal board just in front of me here and I had everything perfectly set on my low bass preamp. And Ivy came mm-hmm. in before, and I like to entertain her in here. It kind of gets her imagination going about music and that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. she looks at my low bass, and it's on her eye level, and she goes, oh, and changes every knob. Because mm-hmm. it's fun. And I'm looking at it going, no! But if I'd had uh, those peace potties on every one of them, she would have grabbed them, and nothing would have changed. Mm-hmm. oh yeah scott scott's got a funny story in chat that he spent four hours trying to work out why his guitar tone was really really bad uh in his little home studio and it turns out that his little toddler had gone up to his audience sono which he uses for his direct input and found the drive knob and just gone Whoop! and he hadn't noticed so it's the one thing you don't look for when you're like ah no yeah, so that's uh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, uh, Lurks Dish says it's real high tech, but painters tape, painters tape over the knobs. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's that, and then from the the quite expensive for what it is to the quite expensive full stop, these made me go ooh, because Golden Age, who are like a Scandinavian brand, or oh, they're sque- uh, Swedish. Uh, Golden Age have made relatively affordable microphones and preamps up until you know, very recently. Like the, the pre-73 is what they were known for the most. And they're making Mark II versions of their Neumann U47 and Telefunken 251 clones, which, like I was saying before, some of the highlights of this year is I got to play with the real ones, which are very nice mics. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, they're making them and they're not cheaping out on anything. So they've updated them. So the 251's got a really nice expensive circuit board with point-to-point wiring. Oh, they both have actually. Um, New flight cases, new CNC base, all that kind of stuff. And so that means that these are going to be made properly and they're going to be $2,000 each which is not cheap. But um, Telefunken sell the actual version of the 251 uh, right now for $9,500. So, you know, if you want this exact thing, but you don't want to shell out Mm -hmm. that kind of money, then, Mm -hmm. yeah, Golden Age are making pretty much the exact same thing for... 
Yeah, a lot less. Because I mean, two thousand dollars is a lot of money, but if you're a gear nerd, it might be a justifiable business expense. Nearly ten thousand dollars is the kind of thing where you sell your car for that. You know, that's too much money for me for a single purchase at all. Ten thousand dollars, but yeah. Yeah, if this is going to be the flagship of your studio where you say, come in my vocal booth, I have a one of these. If you make kind of more indie, folk, warm sounds, you probably go for the 47. If you want more poppy stuff, you go for the 251. And these are the ones where, yeah, you go in and uh, you mean business. Mm -hmm. They do sound fantastic. Although with the Slate modeling microphone, I think that sounds fantastic. It's... That's five hundred dollars. You know, you you don't have to spend mm. silly amounts no, of money. No, no. Not in this modern day and age. But if you want to use something like this without board hardware, that's where the modelers mm -hmm. start to fall down, and right. that's where it can get that's where it can get tricky. But yeah, I certainly wouldn't say no to one of these if Golden Age wants to send me one. They won't. But hey, no. <laughs> and why would they? But yes, uh, that is expensive. Moving on. Talking of expensive, Steinberg's Nuendo. Nuendo, to me, has always been Cubase, but more expensive. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it kind of is. I kind of wish, on a technical level, that many years ago they changed the name from Nuendo to Cubase for Film, or something like that, because... <laughs> I mean, that sounds silly, but that's what it is. It is the same engine. It is literally at the very heart of it, the same program. Mm -hmm. Except that Nuendo has always had the very cool film features, like way back yeah, when I... Like yeah. The university I was at had Nuendo at the same time as they had Cubase 3. And Nuendo, you could do surround sound in like 10.2.1 crazy stuff like you it was like yeah weird it was the very beginnings of surround sound even then which was well over a decade ago and mm -hmm. now they've got new features including uh mixing in dolby atmos so Dol dolby atmos certified adm authoring so if you're working with uh height based information and that kind of thing in nuendo that's all license covered which is cool Mm -hmm. um the, apparently there's a netflix loudness meter that's All very right. cool yeah so this is very much aimed at modern filmmakers because how much stuff now is made specifically for netflix um i know from studying a bit of stuff about sound for film that netflix aside there is an average loudness that the film has to have right through the film or it doesn't pass certification i don't know if you knew that and no i did not know that. yeah i learned about it about this year i think uh where that mm -hmm. that's why uh quite often in films especially there's a good example christopher nolan films the the dialogue can be a little bit hard to hear because it has to be at a certain level. Otherwise, the big explosions and the bombs and stuff can't be that much louder to give you the dynamic blow you away thing. Because the average then is too high. Right. So your two options are turn down the explosions and the bomb noises so mm -hmm. that the, the, the average is there or turn down the dialogue. And with Christopher Nolan, guess which one won? Mm. So... Yes, it's uh, tricky. But yeah, the, the Netflix loudness meter would allow you, in theory at least, to run the whole thing through it, because I'm imagining Netflix have a similar standard uh, where, you know, the, the average, because they don't want to upset audiences by, you, you know, you turn your hi-fi up for the dialogue so you can hear what's going on. You sit down on your sofa... So you're getting comfy, they're all discussing things on camera, and then this big massive noise comes through and you all jump out of your skins. I would imagine that the average is probably a little a little more on the compressed side for Netflix so that you don't upset people. Mm -hmm. uh, because the general, you know, apart from a, a, a lucky few, generally it's kind of home viewing through TV speakers or 
not particularly loud hi-fi systems or even headphones, iPads, whatever. So having a, a meter that's specific to it, I think it's a very cool little uh, addition that means that mm-hmm. you can uh, make sure it's all right. But yes, um, yeah. so yeah, Poo Ninja was joking about uh, uh, Dolby Atmos being like 24.4. But he, that's the really interesting thing about Dolby Atmos is that's not how Atmos works. Um, I don't know if you know anything about object audio. Uh, I don't think I do. Okay, object-based audio is the opposite way of thinking. So um, ha- as we have it now, we have uh, point-based audio. So let's say 5.1, you've got five points and a sub. And you position mm-hmm. a sound either in one speaker or between a couple of speakers or whatever. And then what's saved at the end is the sound of each speaker. Mm-hmm. And so then what gets sent out on DVD or whatever is, this is the left speaker, this is the right speaker, done. Uh, This Mm -hmm. is the opposite way around. This is object-based. And so what's happening is that instead of saying, this goes in the left speaker, this goes in the right rear speaker, whatever, you just say, this sound goes at the front, on the left a bit, up here. This right. sound goes to the right of it down here. And so at the end, when you render it, it doesn't get saved to speakers. It gets saved to positions. Okay. And what that means is it doesn't matter how many speakers the listener has. It doesn't matter what their setup is. As long as their setup is configured so that it knows what it, what it has and what it's dealing with, it decodes mm-hmm. these object-based uh audio clips and puts them in the right place so if you've only got stereo left and right it does a bit of clever maths and just does a left right balance and a bit of a pseudo up and down thing but if they've actually got a 3d audio system with crazy speakers in crazy places it can put the audio in the right places very clever but it means you don't need a separate stereo mix 5.1 mix 7.1 mix yada 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 you just have one with objects Mm -hmm. which is yeah very clever and that's why atmos is a bit bit clever but this 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 this, yeah this is based roughly in the same kind of idea that i was working with at university with a thing called ambisonics which is the early Mm -hmm. is the not the object based but the the 3d based sound and yeah it's uh it's a fascinating way of doing it <clears throat> because at the moment I think you have up to 128 audio objects can be playing at any one time. Right. Uh, but then there's a, uh, I mean, that's a lot of lot of objects to be going on at one time. Mm-hmm. But based on automation and things like that, you can get a single position, single source and you can move it. So you're not saying this object is on the left or whatever. You're saying this object is currently on the left and over the next five seconds, it walks across the screen. Mm -hmm. And you can match that up with a person on the screen. Mm -hmm. So you can really start to have these dynamic soundscapes. Mm -hmm. But you think about it completely differently than you would have done in a traditional mix environment, which makes my head hurt. (laughs) But it's very, very cool that um, Steinberg are tapping into this. Um, there are new algorithms in the Netflix loudness millimeter. Oh, and we need to send this to Christopher Nolan if anyone's got his phone number. There's an intelligibility meter, which tells mm-hmm. you how hard it is to understand speech in the mix based on algorithms based uh, developed by Fraunhofer, who are the people who made the MP3. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> so yeah, you need to send that off to Nolan and be like, Oi, Nolan! Read your meters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw Tenet this week and I really had to struggle to listen to what they were saying most of the time. Really? Yeah. Have you seen Tenet yet? No. No. It was quite a good film. It hurt my head. But yeah, I was really having to try and track what everybody was saying. And the thing is, if I turned up the, the speakers... <clears throat> That wouldn't have helped me much because then when you get to the action sequences, they were just overwhelming. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, kind of cool in an IMAX cinema, but even in my like front room at home, it's just like, Bleh! you do get pasted to the back wall in probably the you know director's intended vision, but it's a little bit unpleasant. <laughs> but yes, um, there's a lot of clever stuff in in here, which is worth mentioning. But yeah, Nuendo is a thousand dollars or a thousand euros, which is a significant step up from Cubase. But mm -hmm. that difference is largely, I would imagine, the extra licenses for things like Dolby's Atmos and all the other stuff because i used to back in the day uh be able to export from nuendo in dolby's ac3 format which is the authoring format that dvds use uh cubase mm -hmm. couldn't do that at the time because at the time mm -hmm. it was very expensive to get a license to do that but i was studying yeah. specific dvd authoring mm -hmm. and yeah that kind of thing was really what nuendo was for and still is so yeah if yeah. you're thinking of getting into film with sound, Nuendo is pretty funky. Yeah, yeah I think I, I use Nuendo for making uh, the film that I made at uni. Mm. The audio in it, for some parts anyway. At least mm. for the trailers. So onto a box that I'm very interested in and don't actually know much about. This is Aloha. Apparently this box could make yeah. online jamming a reality. So what right. does this mean? A uh, proper photo of it. So it's a box with an Ethernet cable, a couple of audio in, or audio out jacks. Let's see what it is. Um, uh, so did, 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 did it. it gives physical inputs and outputs to root audio and MIDI over the internet. Yes, okay. Uh, plugs directly into your router. Okay, so that means that it's eliminating a lot of the potential points for latency. Cool. All the controls done via an app which provides communication and video feed from your bandmates. Um, I have seen things with the OBS Ninja software recently where you can do some relatively low latency stuff, but I didn't know if I'd seen uh, anything low enough because, I mean, you are still dependent on the ping from your your internet line out i mean a lot of modern lines now have got decent ping what's the ping where you are is it it's like three milliseconds Me? yeah um roughly i know you were doing I testing don't... and testing and testing when it changed but yeah there are a lot of lines still where you might be getting a 30 millisecond ping which is like a cheap audio interface uh, There's a bit my much. ping is currently uh, 0.08 milliseconds. Wow. Yeah, so you'll do all right. <laughs> yep. But yeah, a lot of domestic. Uh, that's over the radio connection. My. Mm. Um, oh, no, that's the jitter. Sorry. Of course, that's not the ping. The, um, six, six milliseconds. Okay, six milliseconds. That's that's a not yeah. unreasonable delay, but that's on a dedicated half gigabit connection. Yeah, mm. that's radio as well, which is also takes out the um, the layer two or the layer three core part of it. Basically, goes straight to takes out all the bit between here and the exchange. It's straight to the exchange through the air. There's no other extra bits for it to go through. Yeah. So, so, yeah, apparently they're testing this a lot over 5G as well, but the idea is that it sends a wave quality audio at low latency over a line, which if you've got a line, that's not actually as hard as you would think if you've got a fiber line. Like, I, I can do 17 megabit upload from here, and a 44 kilohertz 16 mm -hmm. bit audio uh, is 1.4 megabit. Mm -hmm. So if you made that 48k 24 bit, you're looking at 2.4 megabit, mm -hmm. which means I could do full wave quality broadcast from in stereo from here uh, with plenty of headroom to do 4k video, <laughs> you know, yeah. 
it kind of the the audio compression thing is almost like a hangover of the previous the previous set of technologies if you like because the 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 size of audio compared to the size of video streaming is hilariously small yeah of course and yet like uh, Pooninja was saying is this the end of underwater phasings and warble from stream yards that we've come to know and love because yeah stream yards mm-hmm. is uh, one of the it's kind of like zoom but it goes out over a broadcast and mm-hmm. yeah you do get the odd kind of thing mm-hmm. which is not great but yeah mm. Mm. that looks like it could be interesting to check out apparently it'll be released in q2 next year which will probably a bit be a bit late for a massive core audience to just snap it up but i think the other side of that argument is now that the world has seen this thing that we're in the kind of staying at home and working from home thing how mm-hmm. many artists now are going to at least take some inspiration from it and take the skill sets they've learned yeah. to now even when they can tour do things like I don't know, like live sessions where they're all at home or a a gig where they do it from a venue that's got filming facilities and broadcast it worldwide, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. uh, There's going to be a lot to take away from what we've learned this year that's going to be a big positive. Mm -hmm. How many people do we know and have, have we known between us and everybody else in chat where there's a band on tour that you really want to see, but they're not doing any dates that come anywhere near close to where you live and you would give anything just to see them. Mm -hmm. Imagine if just a couple of those shows were broadcast around the world for even a paid ticket that was Mm -hmm. a, a small fraction of the cost of a physical ticket, but still a cost. How many people would say, yes, please, I'd, I'd, I'd pay to see that. I know. I, I, reckon there's, I reckon there's a big market in it. Because, uh, yeah. No, it's a very different experience. Mm, it is a different experience, absolutely. But by the same token, let's say the world, quote-unquote, went back to normal. Quote-unquote. Mm-hmm. I've been waiting to see Tool now for a decade-ish. I've, I've not seen yeah. them on tour for, for reasons. And if they never played the UK again but they did an American tour and you could pay a few quid to watch it live. I would. Mm -hmm. But I think that technology and just the willingness to embrace said technology from bands, from management, from infrastructure, I think there'll be a lot more acceptance in the future of that being an option. And I think that that can only be a good thing that to to take away from everything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, just, I just don't know. I think the experience of being in a gig with the audio set up there, like, and also the fact that they are physically near you, there's just something special and different about it. Oh, yeah, and I'm absolutely not discounting that. that what, what I'm saying is mm. anyone who can go will go, but what percentage of people, and it's going to be a pretty high percentage, can't go for whatever reason... And from the band's point of view then, why not broadcast a show to everybody who can't go, even at the same time as the people being there who could go, and actually boost their revenue? Because that's the other thing. Is, is whether you're going to actually go and tour there, because if you're going to go to, you've got to pick the places that you're never going to go to, essentially. What do you mean? <laughs> like I say, if, you, if you've got a show in Manchester... Yeah. On in February, you're not gonna. You don't really want to. If you stream your show in, I don't know, LA to the whole world, you're gonna sell less tickets to the one in Manchester potentially. Possibly, but then and the actual venue shows and the actual ticket sales of those shows are gonna be. But your higher. argument is, I'd rather want to go and be there in the in person. So, like, if I say it's the same reason why they don't put. The Premier League on TV at three o'clock in the afternoon. I thought there was some BBC regulation around that, which is the only reason. Yeah, it's to stop, it's to stop people from not going to other football matches uh, in the lower leagues is one of the main things. Hmm. Because if it's on TV, people just watch it from home and they won't go to the football stadiums. 
that that sounds like a slightly different problem, but I get what you mean. Slightly different, but I think why not think broadcast element, the last day of the tour then, when everybody who yeah. wanted to go has always that, has already gone. That makes, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the, there are arguments both ways, absolutely, but it's the kind of thing where now these options will be there. And it won't be like the one avant-garde artist going, I'm going to do some weird thing. Everybody's going to look at these options now and go, oh, okay, well, we did that last year. I suppose we could do it again. We know what it takes. We know what it involves because last year we had no option, so we investigated it. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean is that the experience of a lot of, not just musical artists, but a lot of people around the world is so different now. How many people do you know this year who would never have even heard of something called Zoom? But this year oh. they're all like, oh yeah, I'm on Zoom. I remember in November, <laughs> December time, taking the piss out of a um, a building I was in where we were using a meeting conference and they had a little Zoom box. Right. Like, Why have they got a Zoom box? Who uses Zoom? <laughs> like, just use like Hangouts or something. This is just why why a why a Zoom box? <laughs> yeah and then look what happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> zoom did pretty well which reminds me it's worth noting at this point actually a shout out to all of our regulars in the discord and all our patrons we're gonna have a zoom hangout before christmas so i'm gonna fix a date oh. yes i'm gonna fix a date and i'm gonna put it in the chat um after this i think we were looking at uh next wednesday the 23rd so just before christmas just before christmas eve where we can all grab a drink and talk to each other on on the zoom and so yeah i'll organize that on the discord uh keep an eye out everybody in the general discord and uh if you do miss any announcements or anything feel free to ask in our discord we'll put a link uh in the description below and someone, either one of the mods or me, will tell you all the information there. But yeah, we're all going to have a bit of a hangout and uh, just chew the fat and uh, talk to each other as people. Which is still Sounds strange, good. but yeah, it's going to be good fun. <laughs> oh yes. Um, I need to manage. Mm, mute all. <laughs> so... Yeah. This is an expensive thing that caught my eye. This is the Heritage Audio Brit Strip which is a quite hard to say word. Um, this is a Neve 773 style mic preamp and DI and EQ and compressor. <laughs> All in one unit. All the Neve style stuff, the compressor is the, what, what they call a diode bridge compressor, which I think is 2254 Neve style. Although, of course, they're not allowed to really say. But... Uh, but yeah, it's um, this is an all-in-one channel strip if you're the kind of person who likes vintage sounds and doesn't want to mix in the box, so to speak. If you want to get a really good sound on the way in, this is how you do it. And this is mm -hmm. uh, in cyberpunk colors <laughs> with uh, yeah, lots of gain, lots of buttons, and a price tag of a cool two and a half thousand euros for one of these. And I thought that, that was a lot of money. It is a lot of money. It's it's a Neve 1073 done properly, so it's not a sickening amount of money considering the quality of the components in here. And mm -hmm. yeah, I thought it was a little much considering that I didn't think there was a separate input so you could just use the compressor. But there is a line input. So you can, after you've recorded, you can go through the line input on the back and then run through the EQ and the compressor at the mix stage as well, which suddenly mm. for me doubles its value. So if you're the kind of person who does mixing through hardware, or if you want really, really nice preamps on the way in, then you can do mm -hmm. that. And yeah, I've been thinking more and more about doing more outboard stuff on the recording side, but then I am very in the box in the way that I mix, which is the way i've always been but yeah my biggest challenge over the last two weeks has been i completely redid most of john brown's recording and mixing setup with with him and everything tracking now goes through hardware which means that we we 
did an entire reamp and track session for a song that he did uh, which had superior drummer three for the drums but nothing else and we hit play with zero plugins and it sounded great and it, it needed mm-hmm. it needed some mixing doing so we ended up with some plugins i think final count was 40 plugins which sounds like wow. a lot but when you've got 70 or 80 tracks going that's not that many mm. that's an average of half of one plugin per track that's that's considering you see a lot of mix engineers with like eight or nine plugins on every track that's a significant change and it sounded absolutely jaw-droppingly good for what we'd done in that short amount of time whilst explaining every step that we did to the camera which was a hell of a task i can tell you that but it was worth it it's good fun but yes um two and a half thousand for one of them is a lot but it packs probably three rack units worth of equipment into one and if you know you like the neve sound could be just what you need has its own very specific power supply as well, which always makes me a little twitchy, but but it is what it is. That's how you get it into one unit, is you don't put the power supply in the same rack. You end up with a line lump that looks like a snake that's eating a dog that sits uh, behind it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, that's also actually a good thing most of the time is getting the power supply away from the audio stuff means you've got less chance of any humming and buzzing transferring over but yes Mm -hmm. last but not least fender have released a new couple of weird and wonderful looking guitars called the tele magico magico with Mm perloid everywhere uh perloid uh blocks perloid guard perloid around the pickups uh yeah it's a little much perloid for me and they've made it in daphne blue and surf green which means it's entirely inoffensive and i imagine there'll be a few people going oh that's the guitar for me and i'm looking at it going nah you're all right mm-hmm. i'm sure it sounds great though with the, the full hollow body and the gold foil style pickups <clears throat> it'll have a very <coughs> excuse me very surf sound which yeah for two thousand three hundred dollars i would hope it will have a really good sound because yeah that's a lot of money for a telecaster with half the wood chopped out (laughs) you're paying a lot of money for a lot of perloid what do you think of this Mm -hmm. guitar design um i'm not a big fan of f cup designs no in general no never have it's funny i do like the the f hole thing but Mm. not on these colors i'm not a big fan of pastel colors um yeah not in a guitar no no. i don't mind uh, that on like a butterscotch telly thin line with humbuckers in it i've always liked the 72 thin line design but yeah they've put the uh they've put like an authenticity sticker in by the look of it uh, behind the f hole i think that's what i'm seeing it might just be the wood grain it's kind of hard to tell i think yeah no it's the wood grain because it's got a very thick grain on these guitars very wide wood mm. grain it looks like there's a cheap sticker behind it that says you know made in china and yeah i can see what uh guys in chat are saying but yeah I don't know if you're after kind of a crossover between a Telecaster and a Gretsch sound, you're probably getting that from these, but yeah, bathroom colors. Yes. Major Prometheus has just hit the nail on the head. They are bathroom colors, especially the Daphne blue. Hmm. Anyway, um, that was the news. I did say there wasn't very much news this week, but yes, uh, zoom hangout before Christmas. And I'm going to put the Patreon Q&A video up tomorrow. The patrons have already seen that on Patreon. So that was good. Uh, I've got another unboxing video to come out probably before Christmas as well. Um, with speakers and cabinets and yeah, that's there's a lot of stuff in that video. Uh, but I did manage to shrink the time down a bit by getting all the bits where I'm faffing around cutting with uh, yeah 20 times speed up. <laughs> Thankfully. 
yeah what else the Audion evo 8 video I, I need to come into the studio uh probably saturday or monday and just get a couple of little close-ups to add in that and that'll be ready to go um there's a video for the adam s2v speakers which is almost ready to go there's a lot of almost ready to go at the moment yeah so Chris, been working on. yeah christmas is going to be like here's all the things austrian audio the oc818 video is almost done uh sure mv7 that needs finishing as well uh that's just what i can see in my uh, uh hps videos folder and yeah oh lewitt mics as well there's two videos for them oh blimey uh you hey deal with native instruments uh did not see that let's have a look Yuhei offer 2020. Save up to 60% on Yuhei. Okay, nah. That's okay. Uh, there's a deal. It's 400 quid for the Yuhei collection, but I've never been particularly impressed by Yuhei's uh, uh, software synths. So, yeah, thank you, Scump Toes in chat. Uh, there is, uh, also, he says no Behringer anymore. There is a Behringer corner. There's been no Behringer news this week. Uh, unfortunately uh as soon as there is behringer news i will bring it straight to you but they are keeping to themselves at the moment they are very much keeping quiet over christmas i would imagine that will keep their uh publicity in the good books while people buy lots and lots of their stuff over christmas i mean the the most the most important thing i can see on their facebook page for behringer right now is a clamp that can clamp a mixer to a mic stand. That's not exactly news. <laughs> so, Clamps. Clamp. Oh, clamp like device. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Get the clamps. <laughs> so, drama. yes. Behringer, I wish I had enough material for a Behringer Christmas special. Yes. If if they were going to send me some money to make a Behringer Christmas special, I might go out my way to do so. But as it is, they're not going to, so sod them. Yeah, is... we can, yeah, we can only do Behringer when there is Behringer. Yes. And I would imagine that after uh, after January there will be more, because then that's NAM time and they'll uh, they'll probably have their own announcements because they seem to do that every year. They just drop a lot of announcements just after NAM. Yeah, but there's, there's lots more stuff that they can copy. Oh yeah, they'll never stop copying. Yeah. Never stop, never stopping. <laughs> yeah, well, once they've copied everything, then they start releasing new versions of all the stuff they've already made. So copying be... themselves, yeah. yeah <laughs> Copyception. Oh yeah, all the old Behringer originals from the 2000s, like the Feedback Destroyer, which oh no, that's a copy mm -hmm. of a DBX. Um, I'm sure they did something original at some point, and they'll just copy that. Kind of random Maybe. GoPro Matt in chat says, but electric drums versus acoustic drums. Thoughts? Well, one goes click click and one goes doof doof. I could give hmm. an hour long lecture about electric drums versus yeah. acoustic drums, but I'm not sure this is the place for it. There's, there's too many variables in that way question too, to be able to answer. Way too I many. I think the simple answer would be um, use the right instrument for the right um, situation. Yes. And it's it's not even a case of something like if you can use an acoustic drum and do because the amount of preparation it that that takes, yeah, that might not be the right answer. We used electric. We used Joe Beck drums for years in the studio. Yeah, um, and got like it's about how you. It's like it's a huge thing. I I honestly believe that. Adam, because Adam had to use electric drums for a long period of time, but we had mm. Joe Becky kit that had sort of real shells and stuff. Yeah. He was forced to play around with drum sounds to try and get them sound as real as possible and treat them like a real kit. Um, I think he gets one of the best electric sounds that you can get, but cymbals never quite work on the electric side of things. Yeah. But well, that's changing. Again, that's that's the thing. That's good. Uh, the new Superior Drummer 3, which I now have and I'm due to make a video on, the cymbals work now. The okay. cymbals are so much better than they used to be. You can crash and bash away on them and they don't just hurt your ears anymore. Mm. But yeah, they're like Danny says in chat, different tools for different jobs. 
Um, If if you've got an amazing drummer and an amazing drum room and an amazing drum kit and the ability to tune it properly and the budget to use that studio, you absolutely... And the right song for it write songs for it as well you absolutely do that there is no way not to do that the the questions come when you get when you start knocking out one of those if the drum is not so good you use an electric kit because you can fix things um or or triggers or triggers actually a lot of really good drummers still use triggers in the right genre um Yeah, yeah and you can you can blend it you can do more it's like recording the di of a guitar alongside like why wouldn't you yeah um but then yeah or if you can't tune drums to save your life or if you've got a drum room that sounds absolutely terrible and boxy any of these will give you a worse result than knowing what to do with the right electric drums and doing it well but, but then that's his whole thing as well yeah. like just because you've got an electric kit doesn't mean just throw on a preset and then record it program it in and it'll sound right you've still yeah. got to treat it like a proper kit you still all the same principles still apply yeah you will get called out for having terrible electronic drums if you have stock standard electronic drums the pitfalls are different uh mm-hmm. but they're just different disciplines you can be good at them both uh, mm-hmm. but they are an equal amount of work and you can either put all the work into one of them or put twice the work into both of them if you're insane like me because you know the but that's for me over the span of a decade um i i kind of got my yeah my experience down with electronic drums first no um learning what a great drummer does first then learning how to make that work with an electric kit then going back to the great drummer and how to get the best out of the acoustic kit Mm -hmm. So yeah. So yeah, this um yeah, that's that's my thoughts on it. Ooh, did you see Rick Beato hitting two million subs? I did not. I uh, thought that was really good, especially when you hear so much about real music dying. Real music is not a thing. Real music has not existed. Uh, that's a weird, stuffy kind of thing that people come up with real music is classical music real music is gregorian chanting real music is the uggs that the caveman made you know real music is what the previous generation deems to be their music Mm -hmm. and rick beato has two million subs because he appeals to the previous generation and that's fine i i don't have a problem with that I just have to say what that is. Rick Beato is one of those people. He'll never touch an electronic drum, electronic drum kit in his life. Uh, he doesn't use amp sims. He doesn't use any of that stuff. But he's already made his money doing what he does. That he doesn't have to explore the alternatives. And he's also musically very talented. He can sit down with any real track and work out crazy technical stuff and explain it to people and i've watched quite a few of his videos and very much enjoyed them uh but yeah rick beato does something very different to what modern producers and engineers do because his skill set was learned in a time where the requirements were very different and his viewers are generally of the demographic that grew up listening to the music that he was producing and that he listens to and diffuses all about which isn't to say that it's music i don't listen to i listen to stuff like you know rush and led zeppelin and beatles and all that kind of stuff but i also grew up in the generation of uh electronic 80s music production and then grunge and then post grunge and all the 90s electronic uh, and then the 2000s new metal era which was all the dawn of pro tools and you know so i very much grew up in an, uh, an era where it wasn't just do what you can with your limited means it was also try and make it sound like a hollywood produced record even though they won't give you the budget even if you sign to the label (laughs) that's the difference between beato's uh 
Beato's generation and our generation is if you were of Beato's generation, you were a talented engineer, you would make a demo on a four track cassette machine, but that would then get you a record deal to go into a big studio to do the, the, the full production. And around the turn of the millennium, that stopped happening. At least in general, there are, there's always the exception. But generally speaking, since then, it's been, um, you know, in the, in the 80s or 70s, y y there was no such thing as a Grammy-winning home producer. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I... Danny says, does the music move you and produce an emotional response? That's real to me. Speakers moving uh, is music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's completely valid, but there is a lot to be said for production quality uh, and it doesn't have to be explainable. That's the thing. I... Probably the main reason that I do what I do now is from being two or three years old and listening to music i always preferred music that was well produced i didn't know why but if you played me a tape demo that sounded muffly and the balance was off you know it might be good music but if you played me the same song that they re-recorded for the album with the million dollar desk that would connect with me more and See, I i'm completely different like I remember listening back to old Funeral for a Friend EPs and 100 Reason EPs. Mm. And when they brought out the album version that was recorded better, I hated it. Ah, I was the complete was other way around. Different. For me, the, the album version of Juno by Funeral for a Friend beats the demo hands down. And you're going to say the complete opposite. I absolutely hate it. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that... I read recently was that um, the psychologist did a study that predicts that the reason why we we like music is that our brain, because it's all mathematics essentially and patterns and algorithms, our brain's able to predict what we're going to hear next subconsciously. Mm. And when we're right, we get a dopamine hit and we enjoy it. Right. Which is why things like the like chord progressions, etc., that are common, um, work in more in, in more more songs. And that works for me around the recordings. Like when I hear a song for the first time and then like it and get to know it, if it's been re-recorded better, and I can even objectively look at it and go, yeah, this is a better recording because I'm not hearing what I'm expecting to hear. I don't get that dopamine hit, so I don't enjoy it the same. Um, also hmm. explains why I don't like really complex jazz because I don't think my brain is able to predict and understand it enough to know what's coming next. And because I can't predict any of it, to hmm. me, it just doesn't sound good. But in reality, I, but I can objectively go, yeah, I can see this is really technically brilliant. Yeah. And there's a lot of bands like that, that I look at and go, you know what? I think they're amazingly talented, but I don't like the music. Whereas the music I like, as you know, is all like <laughs> pop punky, emo, very melodic, always melodic melodies and uh, vocal lines, but it can be complex sort of um, instrumental or things like Coed and Cambria and stuff. Yeah. But there has to be something that my brain can easily like just predict that this is how the melody is going to go. So it yeah. made a lot of sense to me. When I read that study, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. But then nothing exists in a vacuum. So, mm -hmm. like, yeah, if, if you give me a really well-produced song that's just bland, I'm not going to like it. But mm -hmm. if you... The other thing is there is some... There's, there is the nostalgia factor. Whichever one you listen to first, if you're in the right frame of mind, is the one you're going to stick with, which is difficult to get a blind test on. Like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. If, if, if someone... I mean, it's weird, though, because, I mean, there are... I can think of some some um, like Dashboard Confessional songs that were redone, which I prefer the newer versions, but that's because it was recorded better. Like, no, sorry, the, the song had been improved, not just the recording. Right. Like, the actual recording, the, the quality of the recording doesn't matter for me as much. Um, but then also that ties in with our passions as well. Like you've gone into being full on, like music production is your thing. So yeah. better music production should appeal to you more. <laughs> it should, like, by definition. Oh, absolutely. Because you're getting more out of it. You're not just getting out of it that it sounds better. You're getting the why and the fact that that would sit in your brain better as well because your brain would be less easy, less less uneasy yes. when it's recorded as it should sound. You're like, ah, that's how it's meant to sound. Yeah, I suppose that's it. That I've I've always chased that that kind of 
the feeling where you're inside the music rather than you're fighting through it to listen for the thing you're listening for. Because, yeah, I mean, if, if I can't make out what the singer's singing in my experience, how am I supposed to have the emotional connection? Taking it to the extreme, of course. Um, whereas if it's presented to me where I can close my eyes and I'm inside this musical world, then it's much easier for said lyric to do the thing it's supposed to do and emote. And yeah, it's it's an interesting conversation because you can you can go too far one way or the other with it, but that's that's where the, the partnership of songwriter and mix engineer producer mm-hmm. comes in. Yeah. And um, did you point out Andre De Bruin's comment? That's quite a nice one. He's from fifty nine, tries to keep the digital era. Channel helps me a lot. Well thank you. And he did cut tapes in the control room, yes. I cut tapes a little bit when I was studying and I hated every minute out of it. But <laughs> We're inclusive uh, from uh, from kids to grandparents. Everyone's welcome in this community. Absolutely. But yeah, the, the, the reason that I kind of go off on a bit of a diatribe about Rick Beato is because when people say like, oh, isn't he great? It's like, yeah, he is great. But he specifically goes out of his way to a to appeal to his generation which again i i have no real problem with that i just have to make sure people are aware that's what he's doing because that then means that you understand why me and him are are different and give different things yeah because of course that if if we all gave the same thing on YouTube it wouldn't last very long and the person who does it the best wins out and nobody else gets a look in. But yeah. Mm. F- funny thing uh, Bruce Sweden who produced all the Michael Jackson stuff really the early Michael Jackson stuff says the emotional connection to the music is the key and the magic we are looking for which I find to be slightly crass and very uh, um, ironic thing for Bruce Sweden to say because he was the person who would do 80 or 90 mixes of a song if the emotional connection to the music is the key why are you doing 80 mixes I mean, he's not wrong, but he's the engineer. His job is not to make the emotional connection. His job is to present it the best. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it was always a strange one. Bruce Sweden, everyone thought he was like, oh, he's the man. He passed away this year, if I remember rightly. Um, He was a great engineer, but I think his, uh, his out of professional musings that he said quite often were uh, very strange very mm-hmm. strange indeed okay and Poon Ninja right. says well, uh, yeah go on no I was just going to say the new uh, Dota patch that we've been waiting a year for has just come out so, oh um, right so that's the perfect end. time for us to uh, <laughs> go while you get your quick pre-Christmas uh, training in oh no I've, I've got probably about five hours of reading to do first <laughs> well tonight's the reading night and then after you finish your work tomorrow then it's a week of dota well yeah well uh purge will, will be streaming he always does uh patch notes uh and they usually range between four to eight hours so oh wow that's my geek watching a guy read patch notes for Gee six whiz. hours oh i think i'll be watching netflix's the crown that's been my Ooh. thing recently i it, I didn't mean for it to be, but I was uh, in the front room while Mickey was watching it a couple of weeks ago, and it got me. And now I'm three series in. So, oh, wow. did you watch um, Queen's Gambit? Uh, I saw half an episode, and I was just like, "Yeah, I I don't know." Really? Yeah, I I've never been much of a chess guy, and the story was just like, chess. okay. I don't know. That that one seemed a little more contrived. I think the the crown got me partly because the cinematography was amazing, but partly because mm. it's based on people who are alive and doing things now. And it's just maybe it was that connection. It, it is dra- Yeah, of course it's dramatized, but there was just a something about it that was like, "Oh." And then blinked and it was 3 a.m. Oh. So, yes. Mm-hmm. one last thing That's to say you. I think I should say is thank you everybody for tuning into the podcast it's been a, mm-hmm. a hell of a 2020 
and we will see you all let me look at the calendar so this is the last one of these for the year because next year next one is would be christmas eve and the one after that would be new year's eve uh so we'll be back on january 7th to entertain you all and that will be a very good day indeed so yes check out our discord for the uh christmas zoom party where we're all gonna have a drink or many and that's probably going to go on quite late into the night which means that our american viewers should be able to join in after work as well so yes looking forward to it and i'll see some of you then and the rest of you after new year so thank you everybody and we'll see you later goodbye hey everyone that might be the end of the video but if you fancy carrying on this conversation we have a discord server link is in the description we're also on Patreon, which is something you can really help us with. We also are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Hot Pole Studios. See you there.